Welcome to the Pier Glass Poetry Panels. Today's focus is poetry and translation. I'm your host, Stan Galloway, and today's show looks at the global poetry community and its language challenges. Thank you for joining in. Let's meet our first poet. Steve Karmanicki's literary translations and poems have appeared in Index on Censorship, Modern Poetry in Translation, and many other journals. He is the holder of two Penn Awards and a highly regarded English language poet whose work has been described as articulating what it means to be human. His translations of popular and literary Ukrainian fiction and original poetry are published by Kalina Language Press and other literary presses. He teaches poetry writing online using translations of Ukrainian poetry at the Poetry School, the UK's main hub for online poetry teaching. However, he spends most of his life looking after four rescue dogs from Bosnia while persuading himself that adopting a fifth would be sheer folly. Thank you, Steve, for taking time to talk with us today. Yeah, thank you. I should stress that uh, there is another participant in my reading, Miller, who you can't see, who is just off screen. So if I seem a little distracted, I am going to read um, some poetry in translation and also some of my original work because I am kind of a poet translator. Um, I should stress I'm perhaps not the best reader of my work. Um, but I have a kind of dual voice. My voice is both English and Ukrainian. I grew up in a place called Huddersfield in West Yorkshire. I grew up kind of speaking both languages, Ukrainian probably slightly badly, and uh, English, and I have a kind of dual heritage. As I was growing up, I went to Ukrainian school on Saturdays, and I kind of learned that I was Ukrainian, that Ukraine was a country which was occupied, and that one day it would be free. However, it seemed like um, sheer folly. At the same time, there was a kind of sense that Ukrainian Ukraine's legacy is quite complicated. Ukrainians throughout their history were both perpetrators and victims, perpetrators of terrible crimes, but also subject to terrible atrocities too on a, a scale you cannot really perhaps imagine. Um, and this poem is about that dual legacy. It describes my father in the River Cone in Yorkshire, who tries to broaden that out, to take that place and make it part of a much wider legacy of European suffering. Anyway, the poem is called Tickling. My father, with his trousers rolled up to his knee, stood in the beck in peat-stained water that was the gold orange of a delicate tea. The curious frills of lace and snow bloomed over the stones nearby, and his feet were either bronze or ivory. It was not those that took me but his face, the face of a young man glazed with sunlight, stooped over the stream, his gaze at once enraptured and predatory, and then the trout quite still in his hand. In dreams he shows me, there is no sound, as he lowers the trout back into the water. We watch it flex, balance and float, curved to a Circassian dagger, thrust in the river's throat, and the sand and stones of the riverbed, and the water rusted as old blood. Um, the poem references the Circassian genocide, which you can perhaps look up. Um, uh, the Circassian people, one of the peoples kind of taken over by the Russian Empire. And um, I do recommend you look into that. It's a forgotten historical tragedy. This poem is called um, 1915, and it's about um, really about my great grandfather being taken to the Talhof camp. I should stress some of my poems are rather more lighthearted than these, so we'll get the dark stuff perhaps out of the way early on. 1915. By the light of the kerosene lamp, my grandmother, a little girl, kneels like a willow to say her prayers. Shadows settle in the thatch as she whispers, Ochinash. The wind lolls in the firs that sway on the mountainside, hypnotized. The river slips through the earth, a groom sinks into his bride. It is spring and the rye 
blooms with its gold tide under the dust sky. The dead talk if they talk soundlessly. She lays her head on her pillow. A little girl lies on her bed, slender as a willow, while outside the dead pass by, pass by soundlessly through wheat, through rye. In her sleep, she hears someone hammer at the door, a huge heartbeat thunder. Then she creeps to where her mother lays on her bed, crying a wounded bird. And so the soldiers came, a black tide, taking from their house, mother, farmer and bride. Um, this next poem is about the uh, Ukrainian anarchist leader Nestor Machno. Um, again, perhaps because Ukraine's history has been so um, obscured, uh, you perhaps won't know, or perhaps you do know, that Nestor Machno was a central figure in the European anarchist movement. And uh, after Ukraine was occupied, he went to Paris and became a scene, scene painter for uh, a cinema studio. Quite a fascinating character. One of the many uh, fabulous things he did was um, he printed his own currency with a disclaimer on it, permitting anyone to forge it, which I think is a fantastic idea. A few times it was almost captured by the communists, and once he got away by, um, well, they thought this uh, a group of communists marching towards them, waving red flags and singing, you know, uh, singing, you know, uh, communist songs, and it was actually uh, his men who threw open fire when they got close enough, close enough and escaped. And once they escaped too, uh, when they were surrounded, disguised as a wedding party. But again, this is a, that's a poem about ambivalence. I've got all my dogs coming to see me. Do you want a quick look? I know this is a bit... Uh, right, guys, just uh, say hello. That's uh, Mirosha there, who uh, unfortunately um, trod on a landmine in Bosnia, but she's, uh, I think it was a landmine, but she's uh, very happy. So she's coming to see us, and that's uh, Miller. So a bit of a distraction there. Very nice, thank you. <laughs> Right, guys, uh, you have to bear with me. Anyway, you rinse your sabre in the river book, watching the rose colored tendrils unfurl, and a smile flickers across your face, barely noticing the screams of a man who dies, his head resting on a pillow of knotgrass, chamomile, trimitis, summer, a glass bowl. The curve of a still where you see your face, the long hair, sensitive, sensitively carved nostrils, suggestive of a violinist, distorted, magnified, a mirage over the step, a broken god glimpsed at the periphery of sleep. Paris, exile, the backdrops you painted at a studio, flowers grey as ash, the glow of dusk on the Seine. Did you hear the dead men in the wheeze of an accordion, the lisp of thought snow, the vibration through the struts of the Eiffel Tower, which a certain Pandubinsky or Monsieur, as he insisted with a dry laugh, assured you with the very image of a giraffe. No one knows how the man who has brought death commutes, communes with the slain, the taste of iron in the glass of Cabernet Sauvignon, the face of a man pillowed on chamomile and not grass stares at you in the metro, petals of apple blossom, snow of silk, the whip handle of your anarchist cock slides into Halina, warm as the marshes of Padilla in summer, further still waves of steppe grass, cranes nest, crows plashing in the mud laugh, the sabre glides through flesh so easily, a corpse darkens in the rye. The flowers by the roadside seem artificial, embroidered. This um, next poem is called A Song of Exile. Um, I suppose it's really um, much more um, a love poem, if you like, to West Yorkshire, um, much less about Ukraine, perhaps, and just me observing the place with my uh, strange uh, native, but also alien eyes. The river begins as a thread of water clinging to sandstones and clay. 
It burbles childishly, content to reflect the sides of the gully, frolics down the altitude of moor into the valley, water stain the colour of all blood until at last the trees smear themselves into place, snot coloured moss, the birch smudge of talk, ch chalk, javelins of cooch grass over each weir, its waters nervously simper, moving yet motionless, perspex bells, they chime into the waft of lace, foam of champagne yet still, the river descends and falls towards the estuary, a song line of DNA. I don't know how much time we've got actually. Uh, there is a place just beyond the boundary of the farm, by fencing trees, birches, raising their arms as if in surrender, at the edge of the wood where nettles and willow root nod, languidly the summer day unravels in cirrus clouds, transparencies quiver, blurring the field's watercolour. It was a part of Lincolnshire, untouched beyond battalions of leek and peas, the slenderness of young deciduous with a well-muscled oak, a beech perfecting its backstroke against the wind of the North, North Sea. They all overlook this nowhere place, the heart of England still untouched, find weed and emptiness. Miller, not now. I drift down your spine, the way a raft of stratus cloud drifts down the Pennines, your blonde hair an estuary spills through the Saxon shore. You talk in your sleep, I touch your instep, sway over the dead drop at the edge of England. An unseen hand scrawls chalk on the sea, waves whisper, maybe. A gold javelin of sunlight pierces your side. The wounds of God heal, I kiss the south down of your thighs, catch the ocean's perfume, a mouthful of wine. England's snap spine, the paralyzed glow of the horizon, Dover's cliffs, a grin, flash towards France or Spain, bloody tracks run dry, the rain's graffiti. Nearby, shoals of light coagulate and disperse as mercury. The further I drift, the country slips over the edge of the world. All that you grip but cannot hold, the heart's lift, the yearning of the sea beyond gravity. As I drew close to that chance discovery, the wild rose of the south, in a northern forest, England's dreaming mouth, damp with the soft rain of ecstasy, calyx and stame and silk, cathedral where we pray, beyond England's bitter, Sacramental blood, the kiss of sea spray. I seem to have all the dogs actually just at the moment invading me. Um, there's a ghost, by the way, is uh, if you can see him. So, <clears throat> so sorry for the canine distractions. I might read now, I don't know how much time I've got. Um, Three or four more minutes. Three or four more minutes. This is a, a translated poem by a, an author called Bogdan Ihor Antonich. Um, he was a Ukrainian author who died when he was quite young in the 1930s. Not haste, I hasten to add because he was shot, just because he was uh, rather unlucky. Um, if he had lived, I think he would have been a very great European writer. And um, this poem is called Duet. <clears throat> we return slowly to the earth, our cradle. Green tangles of vegetation bind us, two fettered cords. The razor sharp axe of sun hews at a trunk. The music of moss, tenderness of the breeze, the oak, a proud idol. In the wastage of days that bear us, the body warm and obedient grows with itself, two siblings, two flowers of fidelity. The moss warms us like cat fur. You transform the stars into a murmur and blood into music and greenery. The sky glows at the edge of day in the ocean of heaven. The winds of the future sleep and our devoted constellations wait under the frost. While earth does not instruct them to arise, we abandon things to be born to grasp the stars in pure ecstasy. 
the yearning of blood hurts, eyebrows sharp as two arrows, while above us a wall of melody echoes, the pinions of a breeze, our fate pinned on the planets. You burn with growth, thirsty as the earth, become all music. Um, I've been thinking a lot um, about, um, you know, my father and my family. Um, and this is a, this is a poem for my father. Um, and really what he left behind and what he brought to England anyway. This is my father's cap that often left a circular dent in his hair, the imprint of a halo perhaps or a circular furrow, the furrow he ploughed in his father's field before the war and exile, the furrow ploughed by his father. And if you strung them all together, these furrows would have circled the world as they circle it now. The cap in my hands, a pool of time I look down into to see my father at the plough in the sepia light of the thirties, lacquered with sweat, the blade cutting into the fecund dirt. The oxen stumbling over clods, my father looking beyond them to where the earth curves to a cap through mounds of chocolate cordogram. His smile flickers briefly, a kestrel's wing beat, one shadow rumpling a parachute. Uh, this next poem, I don't know if it will be my final one, was um, written perhaps at um, a more optimistic point, point in history. Um, it's reminiscent of being in Prague in the Labyrinth of Mirrors in the park there, which some of you might have visited, I don't know. There are mirrors that reflect not only our image, but other mirrors where we reflected so it seems we walk among a collection of ourselves, each identical, but subtly different in some way. We can't quite catch, and each with the same smile or bemused look. In Prague, I walked among maze with you and felt your hand small and intimate as an anemone, with the sea in mine, fingers pale fronds sifting the light, from behind walls of mirrors and balsa wood, we heard human voices, a dog barking, and the city itself, a long sibilant hiss, like the wind among birches. I th thought I held the key in my hand, the keys that chimed that day in Wenceslas Square, as people rang for freedom to come, or at least the choice to be a partial slave and see the reflection of your voice as liberty. But it was nothing in the end, except daylight, stringent as redemption, recesses of birch and bracken, where your tongue is mine. That's a, a very nice uh, image uh, that that ends with, uh, with, the, with the, the tongue. And I was thinking that, uh, Steve, your, your poetry does what poetry in any language does, transports the reader or the listener across time and across space uh, to these very specific moments and places. Um, and I think that's uh, one of the things that I appreciate so much uh, in the work that you do. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, move on to our second uh, poet and translator. Milan Schell is a poet, translator, and publicist, graduated from the University of Ljubljana in 1985 and living and working in London since 1992. He is a co-author of a satirical epistolary novel and author of four collections of poetry. Several of his translations appear in the Anthology of Contemporary European Gay Poetry and Anthology of Contemporary European Lesbian Poetry. He has presented Slovenian LGBTQ literature with other authors in Berlin, Sarajevo, and Lisbon. His fourth collection of poetry, Tracing the Unspoken, was published 
in English translation by a Midsummer Night's Press in New York in 19, excuse me, in 2019. And his first illustrated poetry book for children, Cosmatis, in 2020. Taking a short break from his writing and research in Belgium today, Milan, we're happy to have you. Hello, Stan. Hello, everybody. Uh, as uh, Stan mentioned, I was born in Slovenia, which was part of what was Yugoslavia, the most northern part. Slovenia is a very small country. It's a nation of only two million people. Uh, we were under the Austro-Hungarian Empire for 600 years, and yet we managed to save our language, so to speak. And uh, I would say that uh, you know the culture and, and, and the language itself are still very very vibrant. Uh, uh, quite a large diaspora lives abroad, uh, across the borders, in Italy, in Austria, but also uh, all around the world. Many Slovenes moved uh, at the turn of the 19th century uh, and after the First World War to the United States. There was quite a large community of Slovenes living in Cleveland, for example. Uh, a lot of people after the Second World War uh, moved to the Southern America, especially to Argentina and Chile, and also Australia and many other many other countries. So, although we are such a small country, you know, people really uh, are scattered all all around the world. As uh, Stan already mentioned, I studied uh, literature and sociology. Uh, in Ljubljana, where I graduated, but then in 1992, I moved to London, where I've lived for 30 years now. Uh, I started to write as a child, mostly poetry, um, sorry, prose, but then uh, later on, I switched uh, onto poetry and published my first book, my first collection, relatively late, when I was already in my 40s. And then uh, further three books followed, the last one in 19... Uh, 2018, I'm sorry. And uh, then uh, the whole story about Tracing the Unspoken, which was the latest book, is, is quite interesting. I started to translate uh, my own poetry for the very first time into English before the book was actually finished. I have a very good friend, uh, American friend, Harvey Vincent, who lives in Paris. And as he doesn't speak Slovene, and he was always interested in what I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm writing, I said, when he came to see me in, in London, one morning I, I got up early and I said, maybe I'll translate one poem for him just for fun, so that he can see what, what I'm writing. And uh, I did it, and then uh, uh, I read it to him, and then Harvey said, but look, for example, here you could improve your sentence a bit like this, or maybe we could change that word with a better one. And so it went, and we would work on one poem at a time until we felt it was good or relatively, uh, you know, we were relatively happy with it. And then we would move on to the next one and to the next one. And so uh, towards the end, uh, as I had to immerse myself so deeply into the English language, because speaking, you know, in everyday life is one thing, but when you, when you start to translate and, uh, you know, uh, transpose your, your own work in, into a different language, you have to approach it from a different way. So uh, towards the end, I wrote a few poems in English first, and then I would have to go and translate my own poetry in English into Slovene. So that was quite, quite interesting. And uh, I have to say that both uh, Harvey and myself, Harvey is also a writer himself, we found this uh, process incredibly creative. You know, and very soon we, we realized that in many cases, you know, what works in the original language doesn't work then in, in, in translation. So sometimes we would have to almost rewrite a certain poem. And that uh, then uh, led me to go back to my original. And I would sometimes change things in the original poem as well. So this process went into both ways. And uh, as I said before, I found that really not just fascinating, but really uh, incredibly rewarding. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to give you just as, as a one example of one poem which uh, was written in English first. And then just for to give you the sound of, of the Slovene language, I will read then the same uh, poem in, in Slovene original as well. Uh, my poetry uh, in this particular book, Tracy the Unspoken, is uh, poetry in prose. Uh, so uh, all the poems are very short. Uh, there are no titles. And my poetry is deliberately, I would say, uh, simple and uh, accessible. Uh, I always like to tell stories and obviously in, in, a, in a poetic, poetic way. So I will read this poem in English first and then I'll read it in the Slovene translation. I mean, Slovene original. <laughs> I emerge into the fragrant evening to touch the coarse bark and embrace our favorite tree trunk. Your ashes lay buried beneath my feet. The old oak offers us shelter. Desperately needing solace, I stay with you in the darkness. And now in the original Slovene. Stopil sam na vrt u pojno dišeči večer, da bi se dotaknil hrapavega lupja in obijel deblo najnega drevesa. Sedim na mestu, kjer počiva tvoj prah pod stopali. Stavo ostanem v tišini in iščem vrezupno v tehe. Nad nama bedi krošnja, Starodavnega hrasta. So that was one example uh, which I thought uh, would give you uh, a little bit of an idea uh, how uh, how we worked. And uh, as I said, um, I always write very personal poetry, all my four books, uh, because I think that, uh, and I'm still convinced that uh, everything personal is also very political and I, I definitely see my poetry in, in, in this way. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, obviously, uh, although th these are poems in prose, uh, to me uh, what is very important in poetry is rhythm. And this is what we tried to catch with Harvey as well when we were translating uh, my poetry uh, into English. Of course, uh, sometimes it was very difficult and we really had to change a few small things. But, uh, you know, that's that's a, a small sacrifice, I would say, which one is happy to make. And, you know, at the beginning, I, I have to say I was very nervous and very possessive of my own work in, 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 in the original. And uh, later on, I, I somehow relaxed and I realized that as it is my material I'm allowed to do uh, or that I have more freedom uh, when when we were translating uh, my work together um, as I said before uh, both of us felt this process was uh, really very productive and and stimulating and we learned a lot about our own work through the whole process and working in a tandem with, with each other. Uh, I translate mostly uh, poetry from English into Slovene. That's uh, my work that I have done so far. And uh, I always had this privilege to choose the poetry uh, that I like. And that's obviously a, a great luxury when you translate work that you really love, that speaks to you. And uh, I think that you are able to, to give it then uh, your best. And uh, so far, I was uh, very, very lucky, lucky in that. Um, just recently, I started to work on translation of my very first uh, collection, uh, Gift with Rolly Grau. Uh, Rolly is from Baltimore in the States, but he lives in Ljubljana in Slovenia for, I would say, over 20 years. Uh, the difference this time is that Rolly speaks Slovene, which is 
a little bit unusual for an American to speak Slovene because there aren't that many on the ground. And this this time, obviously, the, the, the whole dynamic is, is very different. We work more on, uh, you know, tiny details. We are able to work very closely uh, because he has the knowledge of, of the language. And uh, again, uh, I find this uh, process uh, fascinating. I would say I'm a little bit less involved, but we work in, in a different way, which is, again, interesting and, and rewarding. So uh, I prepared a short selection of poems that I will read from Tracing the Unspoken. I will not say much about uh, various poems because, as I said, they are relatively uh, simple and straightforward, and I hope you will enjoy them. We were sitting on the bench at the bus stop. Our eyes interlocked, avoiding the stares of strangers and provoking them with our disdain. Later, the descending road overtook the howling wind of disapproval. And if you'd said, the day is only an inevitable contrast to the night, I would have agreed. During the journey, our eyes sparkled with hints. The evening was a game of questions. You answered none of mine. Sunday morning is glassy and the light is bitter. Blocks of flats built under the communists are magnified by the creaking of an old bus as it staggers on its way to the suburbs. Aimlessly, I end up at the central post office. Through a window, I try to imagine your face in the reflection. The breath on my lips is a measure of distance between you and me. Shards of restlessness often overwhelm your encrypted messages sent from the room behind the locked door. The key I used to open it is getting thinner. Although you constantly provoke me, in my dreams you never utter a single word. As if you were convinced sharp blades of grass have grown in my ears, and I would never hear anything you have to say. Every August you reappear. Memories of that summer night are like blossoms without perfume. I return to your room. Shelves are covered with rows of LPs. From a different space, your voice keeps haunting my music. Slowly, you are teaching me how to listen and love. Nobody knows my body the way you do. I become a happy child, surrendering to your warmth when you, the older, more confident lover, roll over and curl up behind me. Your shape fits mine. We are joined at the hip, covered in sweat and glued together. At such moments, no gods in heaven, nor powers on earth, could tear us apart. They count when ten tentacles my moving fingers. Though I stretch my open arms in the undertow, I'm not able to reach you. The river is an elegant spiral, swarming with fish, and silky moss. On the banks of a pool, I plant a note of hope. 
I'm free when I love. It seems we start the journey from opposite directions. I want to cuddle, you plead like a child, but I'm scared and want to flee. Whatever they did to you and whatever they did to me, we invariably end up in a hopeless collision. You assure me you are brave and you will never give up. I mostly bleed. You were still in bed when I recklessly pulled off the blankets. Your rising and falling hairy chest exposed a vulnerability I had not anticipated. You shivered and abruptly turned away, whispering into your hands as if you wanted to warm them up. But I could not hear what you were saying. At the beginning, I worried about my mistakes. Complicated puzzles unwittingly crept into my speech. I was so embarrassed. The meaning, which was difficult to understand, competed with the awkwardness of our touching hands. Familiarity softens uneasiness. Now, with my feverish palaver, I conceal what should be revealed. Thank you. And thank you, Milan, for uh, not only your poetry, but for talking about that process of working in multiple languages and how to achieve something agreeable in both languages. Uh, I know that uh, many people say that, that translating poetry is impossible um, uh, and I like what uh, Robert Lowell had to say that that he doesn't write translations; he writes imitations. Uh, and so, uh, when as, we'll talk more about this uh, later, uh, but I wanted to thank you for for opening up that idea of the 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 mental process that one goes through in that translation. Thank you. Let's look now to uh, our third poet and translator. Seth Michelson is an award-winning poet, translator, and professor. He has published 17 collections of original poetry, poetry in translation, and an anthology, as well as numerous essays, articles, and book chapters on poetry, typically with a focus on the intersections of poetry and state violence. Having lived in many amazing places around the world on four different continents, he currently resides in Virginia, where he teaches the poetry of the Hemispheric Americas and where he founded and directs the Center for Poetic Research. We're happy that you could anchor today's panel of poets. Thank you, Stan. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks to the co-panelists. It's inspiring to be here with Steve and Milan. Uh, and thank you for all you've shared thus far. Thanks to Brittany Utley uh, and Morgan Duncan for the administrative work behind this. And of course, thanks again to Dr. Stan Galloway, uh, indefatigable emissary of global poetry and these kind of wondrous opportunities to be together. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be with you. Hello to everybody out there listening. Um, I am coming in praise of failure, which may seem counterintuitive, uh, but I love uh, and live by the joys and dangers uh, of the failure of poetry and doubling that in the failure of translation, which is not to say, uh, as Stan referenced, that translation is impossible. Uh, it would only be impossible if life were impossible. Uh, but it's to say that uh, we're always impossibly striving in our own original poems uh, to capture inadequately expressions of self and maybe of community. And those are always partial. Um, and then it's intensified when we try to render that in other languages, uh, which is a great pleasure uh, to be lost in those troubles uh, and blurring those lines because there are causes for us to connect 
and it teaches a certain kind of humility that honors difference instead of being fearful of difference, that encourages empathy instead of antipathy towards what's new and uh, maybe even uncomfortable at times, uh, but doesn't have to be. Uh, so that's why I write and that's why I translate. I've got a new book coming out that I wrote in Spanish called Rengo, and it made me uh, think of it to hear uh, the insights of uh, Milan in talking uh, about working on his own poetry with different translators between Slovenian and English, uh, for example, and how difficult it is. I'm not translating that book. Uh, I have a translator doing it into English for uh, a U.S. press, um, and it's complicated. Right? And I do go sort of scurrying back sometimes and wondering how might I uh, adjust the original um, and other, other times thinking it's uh, not working well in uh, the translation. But I do try to translate other uh, poets to bring them into English. It started in much the same way uh, that Milan uh, talked about working with his friend Steve, if I'm recalling that correctly, and apologize if it, it's not. Let me look at my notes. Uh, Milan was working with his friend... Harvey, apologies, Harvey, Harvey. Yeah. Uh, with Harvey uh, Vincent. And uh, I started, the first book I did was this book, The Ghetto by Tamara Kamensain, a great uh, Argentine poet, one of the greatest um, of the last century, at least. She just died, so I'll start with her. She died in July of 21 at the age of 74. Internationally acclaimed writer, uh, translated into multiple languages, but there was nothing in English. Um, and she'd won all the big poetry prizes in uh, Argentina, and she won the Pablo Neruda Prize from the government of Chile, and uh, Premio Codex, and all uh, all kinds of uh, Guggenheim uh, awards. And I wanted to render her for a friend of mine, like Milan for Harvey, uh, and saying, "Hey, my monolingual English friend uh, had no access to her." So I translated some poems, and that snowballed into doing the whole book. And someone said, "Hey, I know her, as happens in Argentina, and I've lived uh, in Argentina." and have family. My wife is Argentine. Uh, I teach in Argentina. So, you know, the circles are relatively small sometimes. And they, I showed her the book and she said, no, it's impossible. Like Stan was talking about earlier. My work can't be rendered in English. <laughs> and so I said, well, let me try. Um, and this book is the fruits of that. I'll read the first uh, poem that I'll read to everyone today. Uh, and I'm changing what I'm reading for you, Steve, because you read a beautiful poem to your father's cap. Uh, this is a poem from Tamara to her father. This book was occasioned by his death. He was a very estimable figure in the Jewish community in Barrio Once in Buenos Aires, a very old Jewish community in Latin America and certainly in Argentina. She wanted to be secular and study at the university and study philosophy and literature and become a writer. And so there's a great discord in her family as she was somewhat jettisoned, exiled, ghettoized uh, for wanting to leave that religious community of Orthodox Jews uh, and study and be uh, a global poet of many influences in uh, pleasures. So that is the central metaphor that's extended across the book. And this is one of the ways. And this poem's called Kaddish, which is what the one of the most sacred prayers in Judaism, prayer for the dead. You say when uh, when someone has passed. And you need a minion, uh, a group of men uh, who can come together to say the prayer. But she's, of course, a woman. So there's another kind of ghettoization gender, right? So this poem's called Kaddish. What's a father? I dream I still have one. Don't whisper prayers in my ear because you'll wake me. What's a father? I dream I still have one. Ten men invoke him on Monday in a useless round of prayers. What's a father? Ten men invoke him Tuesday in a space without him. His language rings foreign. What's a father? In my house, that's his. They form a minion. It's Wednesday. I'm asleep indoors till their praying wakes me. What's a father? Thursday I'll know because they'll still be gathered in his name. What's a father? Ten men aren't enough to enclose Friday in their masculine circle whose center frees me, orphaned. What's a father? With the first star, Shabbat arrives. And still, I'm without an answer. The men disperse, but I, daughter of Tuvia ben Binyamin, keep searching, awake, so that later I'll be able to forget. So part of the pleasure is uh, discovering 
like uh, my esteemed co-panelists have said, uh, poets you love and working through that love. It's a gesture of love, right? It's a very intimate act. And I love exploring so intimately the diversity of aesthetics uh, that, that I encounter in the poetic world, in languages that I have access to, and in those that I don't. Uh, and so here's another poet that I translate from what's today territorial Argentina, but her name is Liliana Ancalao, and she's Mapuche, the indigenous people of the Southern Cone, spread across what's today Chile and Argentina, but they uh, have called where she's from, Puel Mapu, for more than 17,000 years. And there's carbon dated ceramics, if that's important, that are aesthetically consistent across that time that sync with the oral histories of the Mapuche. Uh, and so this is from a book that's coming out next month, March. It's the second book I put out by Liliana Calau, and she's the first female Mapuche poet from territorial Argentina to have a single author volume in English language translation. And we've done both books trilingually in Mapuzungun, Spanish, and English. So when we talk about the aesthetic pleasures, what journeying, what discoveries, and of course, as my panelists can talk to in the Q&A, we internalize this. It becomes part of us in a certain way, not an appropriation, but maybe an extension of possibilities of seeing new ways of understanding how we are and who we are in ourselves and in common. And so you go from uh, this uh, secular, orthodox, Jewish, feminist, exploring links back to Eastern Europe and Russia uh, in Argentina, to a Mapuche indigenous poet uh, from Puel Mapu, which is the west, the eastern side of the Andes. Uh, and here's just a little glimpse of the, a little bit of prose, testimonial prose, called Memory of the Sacred Land, coming from our new book, The Sun of Always. Sun like S-U-N, the beautiful glowing orb in the sky, the star. Memory of the Sacred Land. This is Liliana Ancalao. With tremendous responsibility, I share these words here. As a human being on this planet, as a woman, as part of the Mapuche people, a people who, after a massacre, after being shattered, are slowly coming back together. I'm from here, the South, the beginning of the world, a place that today is called Patagonia, a place that today is marketed to tourists as the end of the world. I live here in Comodoro Rivadavia. Very young, my father Angelao and my mother Meli arrived at this city, forced from the countryside, run off by material poverty. They were forced to abandon a limited space assigned by the Argentine state after the conquest of the desert. They were forced off that land because it was insufficient to sustain everyone, forced to swap the time of sowing and of calving for a job, salary, schedule, and bosses. From that beautiful couple, six children were born. When I was born in 1961, my family had settled in an oil camp. In that moment, the company that oversaw the mining of that fossil fuel was Dutch. My father was an oil worker for 30 years and my mother was a housekeeper for the administrators of that company. As children, we spent our days playing on metal bridges beneath which flowed little rivers of water, oil, and petroleum. We walked through blackened earth around abandoned wells. We, the forgetful. Today, the basin of the Gulf of San Jorge, in which is situated the city of Comodoro Rivadavia, continues to be a site of oil exploitation. With oil extracted from the ground and from an undersea platform, Today, they control our use of water. They periodically cut the supply to certain neighborhoods until the reserves are restored. The administrators of the natural resource justify the water cuts by blaming them on breaks in the pipelines. But we all think it's due to the oil companies in the region using exorbitant amounts of water to mine oil. And we're all caught in this. Those of us who don't need to work for the oil companies and the many who do, playing a part month after month, year after year for income, social security, retirement, all of us witnesses to the plunder of the earth. So she's a poet with a very different focus and background and interests and aesthetic from, for example, Tamara Kamensai. So here's a, a poem in its sort of a historical uh, political complaint, incredibly specific, like my co-panelists have mentioned, 
uh, through the specificity of her lived experience. It's a photo on Route 40, which used to bisect what uh, is today is sort of the southern cone. Um, and it's been mapped over by Argentina and Chile and, and turned into an interstate. Hmm. And it's an old pathway that the Mapuche used to walk, connecting them and using it as a means of um, networking their many communities uh, traveling by season. A photo on Route 40. It no longer runs from the Senga River to the Genoa, no matter how much mate and talk we pass between us. When walking the route Pu La Mien, it once led us to Copaue's brown ash. Another time, the white wind didn't recognize us. This time, we returned splitting fog, always straining sight not to miss footprints. The groundwater of memory surges from the land. Here, dinosaurs blackened in their own oil. Here, the ash of the fires that burned. He of the choike feet. He who killed his father. He who left, teaching us the loneliness in waiting for him still. Here, the snort of Orqueques and Casimiro's horses on one of their trips to the Mapuche apple lands. And here, those without memory, those who no longer raise their arms to Kalfu Wenu Fucha, Kalfu Wenu Fuche. Here, the weather beaten men, ready to make lassos of rawhide and subject again the bull chupe to the brutal, beautiful bellowing, like that of the Konas trapped in thunder, the thunder heard by our enclosed people and by our Lonco Inacayal in the basement of that museum of horrors, of Holocaust. Oh, how memory goes to its affections, rises like the dew that chills one's ankles, rises to the banks of these rivers, and stops us a moment on this route. We go out into the air that bends us, that combs our hair as if scrub brush, and we take a photo of this image for which we need no reminder. So again, a very different aesthetic. Jump to another project. After three years of teaching poetry in the most restrictive maximum security detention center in the United States for undocumented, unaccompanied children, I put together a collection featuring 41 of their poems, each from a different child, ages 13 to 17, held in isolation cells. And we wrote together, we had weekly workshops, all proceeds from the sale of the book go to a legal defense fund for undocumented incarcerated children, by the way. Um, and I'll share just one poem just to show the range of the, the diversity uh, and, and the, the astonishing range uh, of human possibility in poetry and the joys and frustrations of trying to translate it, which become pleasures for so many more people in the erratic, spontaneous connections that all that can incite in a wonderful way that honors and celebrates difference. So this one's called The Border, La Frontera. It's written by a teenage child uh, from Central America. The border, a place the whole world goes when we dream and want to see our families happy, but they don't let us reach the border because we're from other countries. And I ask myself why, if we're all human beings, if we're all the same, don't we have papers too? Because we're all in the same world, have same feelings, though our skin colors may differ, but that doesn't mean we're not the same. It means that in this country, in my country, there are lots of racists. To be white, to be black, doesn't mean we're unequal. We're equal. We have the same thoughts, the same goal, to walk for days across the desert, called to immigrate. So just showing some of the range of uh, translational possibilities. Another one quickly. I'll read two more poems, and, or three maybe. It's very short. If I have time, Stan, just let me know. And then I'll, I'll get out of everybody's way and hear from the more esteemed colleagues on the panel and add Dr. Galloway. Uh, so this one's called uh, uh, Before Leaving. It's from an Indian poet, Rati Saxena, from Kerala in the south of India, who approached me after I gave a talk on uh, translingual poetics, you know, code switching and using multiple languages simultaneously in a poem, um, Spanish and English, a Mandarin in English, Gaelic uh, in English uh, were some of the things we were talking about. And she came up after and said, you got to translate me. And I said, I don't speak Hindi <laughs> or Sanskrit. And she code switches. Um, 
but she is so charismatic and wonderful. If any of you have the chance to meet her, I would strongly encourage it. She's a joy to be with that she convinced me to try. And we did it through uh, a series across 18 months uh, of exchanges uh, virtually often. And then I eventually went to India a couple times. But, and she's come here. This is from Dreaming in Another Land. Before leaving. Before leaving, close all the doors one by one. Hear them shut with a click. Pat each knob farewell. And try never to promise to return. Not even by mistake. Don't fret over who next might pass through. Each door itself decides this. Before leaving, wipe away each footprint, any fingerprint, no longer needed by anyone. Before leaving, pack your things, bundle every rusted story, and decorate the table with memories of laughter. Before leaving, check every book, throwing out the pressed flowers dried in their pages. Before leaving, erase every line, break open all the knots and smile with strength until life comes to sit in the corners of your mouth. Before leaving, close the final door, and the rest will close themselves. So this is, of course, an imitation and a failure in a wonderful way that gives us access if we can't speak Hindi uh, or Malayalam or Sanskrit. And then I was translated into Malayalam and Sanskrit and different Tamil um, and what does that do, right? That just thing, it spreads our network of possibilities for connecting uh, through uh, language and of, of stretching language itself. And I'll read two quick poems by a young poet from Argentina, uh, sorry, from Uruguay, uh, named Victoria Stoll. It's called Bichobola, which is a roly poly, those little tiny uh, bugs that roll up when you touch them that are gray. Actually, there's, that's the cover image. Um, and I love this poem. It's untitled, a different aesthetic entirely. This, uh, like Milan, is a, is a prose poem, which is again blurring lines and translating, right? It's translating form and questioning boundaries in a wonderful, joyful way uh, that explores new possibilities through uh, irreverence, defiance, uh, a, a terrific questioning of all. The bees use their stingers to carve poems into tree trunks, and the grasshoppers are beautiful with their sad, attentive eyes. And all that we didn't see during winter, because we believed it frozen, begins to whisper. And suddenly we realize we're surrounded by beauty, pure, quiet beauty, which is the most glorious kind, because its musicality is almost inaudible. But if one listens hard enough, it can be heard like a termite working on a violin that no one has touched in years but that the bug makes sing while destroying it or not. Who knows? <laughs> Very playful poet. And then just for aesthetic range, another poet, a wonderful feminist woman from Uruguay who's also a therapist besides being a poet. And it's a very cerebral uh, sort of postmodern Baroque or neo-Baroque poetry. And just one example, and I'll be done. It's a very short poem. And her name is Melissa Machado. This poem is titled Nine from a serialized group of poems. Take my unbound flesh, this weak pulse. Protect me from wrinkles of gall, the acrid verb. I, who braided my dead into my hair, who sprayed myself with their scent, want to go back to sewing my heart. And in many ways, that's what we're always already doing uh, as poets and as translators and coming together like this through poetry. So thank you again for listening and giving me the chance to share my uh, thoughts with, with your much more interesting and wonderful ones. Well, thank you, Seth, for your enthusiasm as well as your uh, vast uh, repertoire of poems that, that you've presented for us. Uh, I, I'm always amazed when I hear poems that have come from cultures and from uh, geographic places that that I have never been. And I think I think I know a little bit about that place now because of the poem. Uh, and so you're I, I agree with you when you say that that poetry is a way of of not 
separating by way of joining people together. It's not appropriating someone else's material. It's honoring it in a way that says this is part of our human experience as well. So I want to thank all three of our uh, panelists today, and we'll transition now into uh, discussion, uh, questions. You know, anyone is welcome to, to ask questions, um, and all of us are open to answering them, uh, including uh, people who may be listening uh, that have not spoken yet. So uh, Steve is going to slip out at this point, and we will continue Maybe with... Sorry. So good to have you here, Steve. Um, so sorry. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> and so we will we will go on and talk about this the, this process of translation and and again, is translation even the correct word for uh, for what we do when we take a poem from one language and we represent it in another language? Um, and so uh, let me just first ask a very general question. Um, when you're translating, uh, because both Seth and Milan have done that, how, where does literalness and intent meet? Okay, so they're not going to answer my question. Um, l let me rephrase it. <laughs> In translating, you can get a very literal translation or you can get one that is true to the spirit of what is said without necessarily the, the language of what is said. And, and I just wonder you know, where on that continuum uh, you might find yourself more often. Well, there are, there are several schools, you know, uh, and people have obviously, you, you talk to various translators, they have different ideas, different theories, and different approaches. Uh, I personally, you know, from, from my own uh, modest experience, I would say that whenever I meet a new voice that really speaks to me, uh, as you said before, for me, first of all, it's, it's a real pleasure and uh, privilege to present that new voice in, in a new cultural space. And as I as I mentioned before in, in, in my my slot, you know, sometimes things in, in one language don't really work when you try to translate them into, into a different language. But I try to, to present the spirit, as, as you said, you try to be as, as honest and as faithful to the original as you can. But I'm never orthodox in my approach, I would say. I, I think it's it's more interesting and, and more rewarding um, and more honest, you know, to, to, to find a way somewhere in between. I, I really I really don't like extremes, you know, and orthodoxy I find really off-putting. So that would be my, my take on it. Well, I agree. And it, it warmed my heart to hear it. Um, not only because of the synchronicities in process, but I think in particular in response to this junction of um, intent uh, and and literal translations, there, there needs to be uh, maybe what Milan uh, mentioned during his reading of uh, a joy in rhythm, uh, and that was directly mentioned in uh, Bichabola uh, by Victoria Stoll with musicality. Um, there there is a, an emotional truth in the musicality of a poem that I deeply uh, enjoy and trust. Uh, and cert in a certain way, I could exemplify it with Rati Saxena's work. So when I was translating her, she convinced me to do it. And I really like her as a person and I like her poetry. Uh, and it was unavailable um, to English language audiences. And I wrote for a US audience, which of course colors the palette uh, of the diction. Um, in specific ways and excludes possibilities, which makes the maintenance or the translation of musicality even more complicated, but uh, was a great challenge and joy too in its own way as a writer uh, of, of imitations or new poems based upon the original, but always faithful to that rhythm. So I would have her send me recordings of her poems in Hindi and I would internalize them so that I could sing them the way uh, maybe my sons can sing songs 
they've heard me playing on the car radio that they don't understand the lyrics, but they can they can nail the melody. Uh, and so I could nail the melody in Hindi, not knowing what I'm saying. I do the same with Lilian and Kala with poems that are in Mapuzungun. Um, and then try to render the poem according to those guidelines without ever being uh, fascistically orthodox in adhering to the musicality to the detriment of the connotative meaning of a narrative, for example. But then again, not all the poets are narrative poets. You heard Melissa Machado. She's a very lyrical poet. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, that's one of my uh, grounding, uh, guiding uh, elements of a translational experience in trying to get that musicality, uh, if I can, and whether it's metrics, I translate Amir Or, who's a great secular humanist living in Tel Aviv. Uh, I try to get his poems according to their uh, formal rhythms. He's a he's a formal poet, uh, so this needs to be in you know dactylic pentameter, okay, with end rhymes, okay, uh, or or free verse, and and that's a great challenge. Like what a pleasure for people who love words and poetry and <laughs> right, <laughs> and it's so. Uh, it's impossible and wonderful at the same time, the same way that uh, it would be impossible to escape mortality. <laughs> so it's not that, not that the process is impossible. Um, so that's a little bit of what I wanted to share. Thank you. Yeah, I think read, you know, translating is really the, the deepest way of reading somebody else's work. That's, that's how I see it, you know. You can never read as intimately uh, uh, for example, a novel that you read or a poem that you read. But once you start to translate, you really have to go deeper and deeper and deeper to, to try and uh, reach it as, you know, as close as you can. And I use, uh, as we, uh, Seth, you were talking about the rhythm, which is very important to me. I use a very simple tool. I, if I can, or if I know the language, I try to read the poem aloud to myself and then read aloud the translation and then you see or you hear whether you you manage to, to to catch that rhythm in the poem so it's it's a very simple tool but i think it's important the sound uh, of of the of the poem as well and that's uh th that i think is is really at the heart of translation is trying to get it to be the poem in this new language as much as it can be recognizing that that there are elements you know that don't come through you know there there are words um words in english that have multiple meanings yeah. that um that that in other languages there would be separate words you know for those and 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 the word that that comes to mind maybe not the best example the word still you know which might mean not moving but might also mean continuing to exist um and so as a translator I, I think i know your answer to this but how do you deal with <laughs> with that kind of language that may have multiple uh multiple meanings or or nuances um and and then i'll add a, a, a part b to the question do you ever use footnotes when you translate mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes that is really necessary. You know, if you are translating from a very different culture and very few people might know it, then that is really a necessity because otherwise it becomes meaningless, you know. So that that I think that is important and you just have to do it because that enhances then the, 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 the meaning and uh, people are able to understand the, the, the whole meaning of, of the poem but i would i would use what seth said uh, you know very beautifully uh, before translation is a wonderful failure and that's what it really is you know you try to 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 get as close as you can and sometimes you know when uh, you were talking uh, stan about uh, certain words you try to choose the best words that they are and um Sometimes you are more successful and sometimes you are less successful. Sometimes you have a good day, sometimes you have a bad day. But, uh, you know, it, like, like everything else in, in, in life and, uh, and in our work, we, we try to honor the original as, as or I do uh, as much as I can. Yeah. Very good. 
Uh, anyone want to add to that or are there other questions uh, that people have? I have an additional question if we have some time. Mm -hmm. So I like to preface my questions and these things with kind of a reflection because I find these very thought provoking. And so something I noticed in poems that all of you shared, and I wish uh, Steve was here for this too, but I noticed um, a lot of referencing nature and the land and also the flesh and um, mortality. And it made me think about how the um, the land, of course, becomes very political as borders change, as people try to cross borders, as violence happens between countries, but that the land itself remains and um, the you know relative permanence of that and the importance of that and I feel like it's a very meaningful thing the self in a way to connect to the place in a way that has all of this history layered on top of itself and so I'm wondering kind of how landscape and nature and our you know flesh and mortality have played a part in your poetry especially as we look at international relationships. That's a beautiful question, Rachel. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you. I'll just say quickly and then get out of the way for Milan uh, <laughs> that I think that uh, that is basically my translational process uh, synopsized in the metonym of borders because borders are a point of connection and disconnection uh, and they're also artifice. Um, they're not, uh, th their impermanence uh, goes uh, unacknowledged until we focus on what they really are, right? Like you said, they're shifting. And even within the border, the border is not a fixed thing, right? It's, it's blurry and wavering and it's permeable and people are going back and forth. And that's the commingling of languages. And it's uh, at the semantic level and the cultural level. Uh, and for me, uh, it's an astute question uh, because that really emblematizes what, what we're doing. Uh, when we work as translators, right? We're simultaneously uh, connecting and disconnecting. I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, what what I would what I would say is, you know, uh, you were talking about the countries, uh, Rachel, and how that reflects in our work and how it affects us. You know, first of all, we are all strangers in our own countries, and like uh, you know. Um, Steve, who, who has uh, Ukrainian roots, and myself living somewhere else, you know, uh, you, you arrive into a new country, into a new space, and you are a stranger, a stranger all over again. And myself, as a, somebody who sees himself as a, as a gay person, again, from the margin of the society, I'm a stranger again. And yet, uh, I have a feeling tonight, you know, all three of us, it feels like the whole world is too small for the three of us, for all the poets, you know. We we encompass the whole world, you know. We we are so different, all three of us in, in this case, and yet, you know, those similarities are really striking and it, it, it gives me strength and, and, and hope and uh, I really feel elated and, and, and happy, I have to say. It's a wonderful experience. <laughs> Beautiful, Milan. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you both. That, that was the exact kind of reflection that I was hoping to, you know, get more of. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions, uh, either from the panelists or from outside? Well, let me let me ask a, a, a softball question to kind of end us with then uh, when when you tell people you translate poetry. What do you hope they understand from that? <laughs> That's a tricky question, you know. Uh, because my own translation is only one way of reading. You know, there are as many readings of a one poem as there are, 
you know, sometimes when when you were, uh, I went and uh, attended a, a translating uh, translation workshops. For example, there are five six people around the desk or around the table, and you translate the same poem. And if there are five people, you get five different translations, and that's wonderful. And um, I don't know whether that answers your question, <laughs> but uh, again, you know, this is the beauty of of, of what we do. And uh, we we try to present our own version, and I I always invest a lot of uh, you know emotional capital into what what I do. I try to be as honest as I can uh, and work as hard as I can, and hope that the other people will enjoy and appreciate the poetry that I worked on as much as I did. I'll yeah, I think. That. Oh, sorry, Stan. No, no, go ahead. I will just save my comment for after you. Please go ahead, Stan. No, I was just going to say that I, I think that unless you work at translation, you have no idea how much work it is. Um, and that people think translating is a pretty simple process. I mean, that's why we have Google Translate, right? Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, I, I appreciate what you said, Milan, that um, that you have in, so much emotional capital invested in a single poem translation, and it's not even your work. It's somebody yeah. else's poem, but you do it for the love of poetry and for the love of, of this other person's artistic expression. And uh, yeah, that, I think, is, is part of the, the unacknowledged fame or honor that should go uh, to translators. Mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me, Stan, your comment of uh, something that W.H. Auden said, why it's so hard to find and enjoy good critics uh, writing about poetry. Uh, because when you're a poet, you humble yourself before poetry. And when you're a critic, you have to humble yourself before another person. And that requires a different kind of uh, humility, obeisance, uh, willingness to give oneself over. Uh, and so it's a different skill set and uh, orientation. In, in response to your question, uh, initially, what do I hope people understand? I would build off the idea from Milan of hope. My hope is not necessarily that they understand anything. My hope is that uh, they would be willing to think of that orientation to the world, that orientation to difference, that isn't it a joy that there's so much complexity, difficulty, and diversity in the world? And that we didn't be startled into fear and aggression by that difference, but instead, wow, we can explore this. How can we engage it? How can we think it through? How can we connect it to our lives and share it with others and become a bridge ourselves? Um, and so uh, it would be more of an idealistic hope uh, that, that people would be willing to in, engage in that difference, which is the, the process of writing in poetry, uh, a translation, just as it would be in, in other forms of cultural communication. Yeah, I would add to that, you know, for me, a poem is like a house. You translate it and it feels like you have opened a new window and you offer to the reader a new view, a new vista. And obviously then it's up to the reader to open that window or not, but you've done the effort and you gave him or her the opportunity to open a new window. Yeah, that's a beautiful image. Um, and, and I go back to a, a phrase that Seth used uh, just a moment ago, uh, the orientation to difference or of difference. Um, that's what translating poetry is, is it helps us reorient uh, our understanding of the world um, in, you know, one degree or, you know, a fraction of a degree. Uh, but somehow, hopefully, every poem we read, whether it's the original language or not, will help will, will make us think about ourselves and the world we live in and orient or reorient to the differences that we find yeah and also i see it as, as a, a poet myself you know sometimes where when you write it feels like you you live in your i wouldn't say a narrow world but you focus obviously but when you read and translate somebody else's word you know you realize there are so many words and worlds around you, you know, it's not just your way, it, there are so many ways, and that richness is so empowering, you know, and, and really wonderful, and that's why I do it. And that's a, a beautiful uh, place to end, I think. 
um, the idea that we do it because of the love we have for the world we live in. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Milan. Thank you, Seth. And uh, in absentia, thank you, Steve, for your comments today. For the Pier Glass Poetry Panels, I'm Stan Galloway, wishing you a poetic day. <laughs>